recording. All right, perfect. And I'm going to share my screen. So perfectly, everybody can see the screen now. So again, transitioning to Medicare, uh, for those who may be new to this experience and haven't yet to meet uh, me, my name is Marcus Rather. I'm a financial advisor, been in the industry eight years as of this month. Hard to believe it's been eight years since I graduated from DCU. Uh, but eight years have kind of come and gone so quickly. Uh, but I'm a part of the Terra Investors and our office is located in Glen Allen, Virginia. Um, don't let the uh, location intimidate you. I am uh, licensed in various other states. So I'm not only familiar with uh, clients throughout Virginia, but also in other states as well. Uh, for the conversation today, we're going to be focusing on, again, that transition uh, from any other plan uh, into Medicare. And when you look at who provides health insurance in the United States, you can see a vast majority of individuals are, are covered by an employer-sponsored plan, uh, whether that be a large employer, small employer. Um, you have a few that are covered by Medicaid, um, some that are covered by Medicare, or some other individual type. Uh, but most insurance uh, carriers or those who are insured are covered by some type of employer-sponsored plan. So the retirement health care challenge, as we look at the challenge that uh, most retirees face, uh, first issue is that there's oftentimes a challenge with the transition from an employer insurance plan to Medicare. Um, oftentimes they miss the open enrollment period or their eligibility to enroll in me Medicare. Uh, so it's a challenge or an issue to avoid late enrollment penalties. Um, also with the delay in enrollment, they might also find some coverage gap, um, whether there's a gap in their coverage or if they don't have enough insurance to cover their uh, medical needs, whether they need some type of supplemental coverage or anything along those lines. Um, and it's also a challenge or issue to secure adequate coverage with private insurance to fill those Medicare gaps or cover any prescription drug costs. Um, so that's one issue. The second issue is understanding the first year health costs, right? So all premiums must be paid out of pocket um, when you're separating or you're moving from health insurance through your employer versus health insurance and Medicare. Uh, most people who have health insurance covered by the employer have a large subsidy towards those premiums. So you're part of a large group plan and the percentage that you're paying in premium for that coverage may be lower. Uh, but what you're finding is when you get to Medicare, you generally don't have that same employer uh, supplement or coverage. So that understanding your first health year cost in terms of the premiums, but also additional costs like dental, any co-pays, any co-insurance. Um, oftentimes people overlook what they're expected to pay out of pocket uh, for health insurance and retirement. The third one, um, expenses including long-term care. Uh, please be familiar that Medicare does not provide much resource for long-term care. Um, oftentimes people confuse Medicaid with Medicare and in order to qualify for Medicaid, you generally have to be below a certain level of poverty. Uh, but Medicare, the Medicare insurance that we're talking about today, there aren't any uh, additional benefits for long-term care. And long-term care isn't always simply nursing home. Uh, this could be home health care. It could be skilled nursing care. Um, adult daycare, something along those lines, or even in-home care. Um, it's not always a facility in reference to long-term care. Um, you can receive various different levels of support for long-term care. Nonetheless, Medicare does not uh, offset any expenses associated with long-term care. So our agenda today um, is to go over a few different uh, key items as you look to transition into Medicare, uh, whether you're soon approaching Medicare, if you're already enrolled, uh, but still covered by a group plan or if you're a few years out uh, we're going to go over these five things one how medicare works with employer insurance um, two who needs to enroll in medicare and when number three how to enroll in medicare uh, number four how private insurance works with medicare to provide complete coverage and number five how much you can expect to pay after going on to medicare so Going off on the first point, how Medicare works with employer insurance, uh, I want everyone to really focus in on this chart uh, because I've had plenty of conversation on who pays who first, right? So if you are 65 or older um, and you're entitled to Medicare, so that's the eligibility for Medicare unless you're, I believe, Jennifer, you can ch chime in on this. If you're disabled, 
um, or under certain circumstances, you may be eligible for Medicare prior to 65. Uh, but if you're well-bodied, well-health, uh, generally your earliest eligibility for Medicare is leading up to your 65th birthday. So you have three months prior to 65, the month in which you turn 65, and three months following as when you're first fully eligible for Medicare. Is that right, Jennifer? That's correct. Yes. Perfect. Um, so on the chart, if you're 65 or older, if you are covered by a group health plan, because you or your spouse are still working and the plan covers more than 20 employees, your group health plan will be your primary insurance. Medicare would then be secondary. So if you are enrolled in the basic parts of Medicare Part A, but you're still employed and covered by a large, more than 20 uh, employee plan, uh, your group health plan will be the primary insurer. If you happen to be part of a group health plan because you or your spouse are still working and the plan covers fewer than 20 employees, then Medicare is the primary insurer and your group health plan is then secondary. But if you find that you're a part of a group health plan with retiree coverage, if you are fully retired and you have retiree health coverage, Medicare would be the primary insurer, then your retiree coverage would be secondary. And if you are on COBRA, um, then Medicare is the primary, COBRA is the secondary. So generally uh, it's easier to understand from this one. If you're still employed, whether you or your spouse are still employed, and you have group coverage that has more than 20 employees, your group health plan will pay before Medicare. Under most other circumstances, Medicare is your primary. All the other supplemental insurances will be secondary. Uh, Jennifer, anything on that one? No, that's pretty standard. Yes, yeah, so you, you, you really want to evaluate the size of the company as to whether or not, but it's always a good idea to check with HR to make sure that the coverage that you have through your employer is considered creditable. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll really come into play, especially when it comes to drug coverage. But for the most part, double check. If you work for a company that's even around the 20-ish mark, just double check um, with HR and say, you know, I have the option to go on to Medicare. I just want to verify that the coverage here is, you know, considered creditable by Medicare. And, um, and they'll be able to let you know uh, because you do want to enroll in Medicare if for some reason your company's insurance um, would end up being um, secondary to Medicare. So speaking on that, uh, I think there's a perfect segue on making sure that the group plan is creditable uh, because point number two is actually who needs to enroll in Medicare and when. Uh, so as I mentioned before, your eligibility based on you know age to enroll in Medicare, all the different parts, part A, B, C, D, or any other supplemental plan there, um, it's generally your age 65. And again, you have three months prior to your 65th birthday to enroll in all of those parts or the month in which you turn 65 or three months following. Um, if you happen to miss that, um, then I think they have open enrollment January through March of every new year, unless there's some type of qualifying event. Um, but if you are someone who is under the age of 65 and you're currently working, Chances are you're not eligible yet for Medicare, so you likely would have to have a group plan through your employer, whether they have a group plan larger than 20 employees or less, or you might have to find some type of marketplace insurance. Um, so your eligibility to enroll in Medicare will be pretty much slim to none, right? Um, but if you are under the age 65 and you are retired, based on age, you still are likely not to be eligible for Medicare. Um, so the question that you do want to ask, if you find that you're retired and not yet 65, is does your former employer offer a retiree plan? Or if you're married, um, can your spouse, or can you get added to your spouse's retire, uh, your spouse's group plan, whether they're working or retired or something along those lines? Um, so if you're under 65 and retired, still not eligible for Medicare, See if you're eligible for a retiree plan through your previous employer or if you can get coverage through your spouse's plan. Um, now, say, for example, you're not married, um, whether widow, divorced, or just naturally single, never been married, um, and you cannot get retiree coverage. In this case, generally, we have to look at marketplace insurance um, if you're not eligible yet for Medicare. 
Um, so that's pretty much the solution for that one, right? Um, but if you find that you are over 65 and working, questions that you do want to ask, one, does your employer plan cover 20 or more employees? As we just mentioned, if you have a group plan covered by more than 20, that may be a eligible insurance to not have to enroll in Medicare parts A and B. Um, if yes, you can stay on that employer plan and delay your Medicare. So you do want to talk to your benefits administrator, as Jennifer had previously mentioned, to see if you should enroll in any part of Medicare. Chances are that you may be advised to enroll in part A. Um, Jennifer, I think this is the perfect time to pause since we haven't explained that. Um, are you able to just explain briefly what Part A is and what it does? Yeah, so Part A is hospital. So it's um, coverage for you while you're in the hospital. Um, most people have a premium free Part A. Um, when I say most people, I mean that either your working history or your spouse's working history would qualify you for a premium free Part A. There is a premium that's attached if you don't have the required work history. Um, the work history is 40 quarters throughout the course of your lifetime. If you were a um, person married to someone who met that work requirement, you would have a premium free Part A. Some people, um, do have to pay for it, you know, if they don't meet that requirement. But but for the most part, um, like I said, the majority of people meet it somehow and uh, don't have to pay for it. And that's why they're advised, even if they are still working. Um, and you'll see on the next slide, there's a there's a little caveat to that, but um, that it still is a good idea sometimes to enroll in Part A just because you're eligible for it at your 65th birthday. So I will say I have had a conversation with a client um, and I've seen a few circumstances. I'm glad that you, you know, mentioned that part A is uh, zero cost for most members. Um, but have you seen many scenarios where there is a cost for part A? I think some scenarios I've seen um, one, you know, woman client, she was a, uh, a homemaker for most of her, most of her life, but she did not have a lot of credits. Uh, to be eligible for Medicare or things along those lines. And I like to say something about military or civil service employee um, where there weren't but so many credit hours that were credited for that as well. But have you seen anything like that, Jennifer? I ran into it one time with someone who had not um, lived in the United States long enough to have the required. Mm -hmm. And so they were really considering it. And honestly, that was that's the only time that I have come across it. Um, Mm -hmm. And they were, they knew they were going to have to pay for a par day. Gotcha. And this was a few years ago. I can't even remember what it cost at the time, but it was a few years ago. Um, so chances are maybe not that common uh, that someone would have to pay for part A. Um, but we're going to get into the other parts a little bit later. Uh, speaking of Medicare, uh, and I actually read some current event here that um, high uh, was the health savings accounts, HSAs. Um, for those who may be part of a high deductible insurance plan, uh, one of the, the advantageous accounts would be a health savings account. Um, these accounts are accounts that you can put money in. Uh, they can go in pre-tax. So it is a little bit of a tax uh, deduction from your income. Um, the money can actually be invested. In most cases, they're saved. But in some cases, uh, you're, you can or should invest some of the money in a health savings account. And if there are qualified medical expenses, you can take that money out uh, tax free. So there's like a triple tax benefit of a health savings account. Why we're talking about this is because once you become enrolled in any part of Medicare, um, your contributions to an HSA, I believe, are restricted. Um, so they are going to be increasing the amount for 2025. I think this year the amounts are the same as they've been for the previous few years. Uh, but I just got an email today saying that they've announced the new uh, contribution limits for health savings accounts. Uh, but this is a perfect time for those who may be part of a high deductible plan or if you're nearing retirement and you have an HSA to be familiar, that contributions to a health savings account are going to be restricted once you're participating in any part of Medicare. So if you enroll in Medicare Part A, but you know defer enrolling in Part B or any other supplemental plan, um, if you're someone that's making contributions to an, a health savings account, this is something that you may want to consider. Uh, so if your employer plan is a high deductible plan 
and you are contributing to a health savings account, an HSA, you would need to make a choice. If you enroll in Part A, you may not contribute to an HSA. Um, also, I want to parenthetically note, this is not the same, I don't believe it's the same as a flexible spending account, an FSA. The difference between an FSA and an HSA, FSAs do not have to be associated with a high deductible plan. Generally with an FSA, you have to spend the money in a certain time period. Uh, I think it may be January to December or there's a deadline. So it's kind of like a use it or lose it benefit. But with a health savings account, uh, this money can stay in the account until you actually need it. So with a health savings account, you're not required to spend that money in a certain uh, time period. So if you are over 65 and you're working, again, does employer plan cover 20 or more employees? Um, you do want to keep that in mind. If not, if you are working with an employer whose health insurance covers less than 20 employees, um, this is the only way to have complete coverage and avoid penalties. So you must enroll in Medicare at age 65 if you're working with an employer plan who covers less than 20 employees for health insurance. If you are over 65 and working in a plan covers less than 20 employees, talk to your benefit administrator, find out how your employer insurance works with Medicare. You may be able to keep your employer plan for supplemental coverage but you must enroll in parts A and B. You can keep your employer plan for drug coverage. If it is credible, uh, there's no need to enroll in part B. So the repetitive theme here, more or less than 20, if you have less than 20, you should, or it's highly suggested that you enroll in Medicare part A and B. If you are over 65, still working or covered by a spousal plan that's greater than 20, then you don't immediately have to enroll in parts A and B for Medicare. Um, when you turn 65, whether working or retired, um, the suggestion is that you call Social Security Administration to ask if you need to enroll in Part B. Um, why this is suggested is you can keep a record of the conversation to avoid possible penalties later. So if you happen to speak with someone from the Social Security Administration office and you ask them based on your situation, on eligibility, not cost, but on eligibility, if you should enroll in parts A and B and they say no when you should have, um, you may be able to file an appeal and avoid possible penalties later. While we're talking about that, if you happen to miss enrolling in Medicare when you're supposed to, you know, earliest eligible or last eligible, there is a 10% penalty that you pay uh, over the lifetime of being on Medicare. So it's not just a one-time penalty, it's not just one year. I believe that 10% penalty is over the life uh, of your retirement and your enrollment in Medicare. Um, and I think I just answered that there. So 10% for every 12 month period, you should have been enrolled. Uh, where this becomes a nightmare is if someone was supposed to have enrolled and they did not enroll for many years, that 10% is for every 12 month period. So however many multiples of 12 month periods you have missed, um, there's a 10% penalty for every multiple. Um, and also just noting COBRA, uh, if you do go on to COBRA after retirement, um, you must enroll in Part B by the end of the eighth month after your employer insurance terminates. Um, if you stay on COBRA the full 18 months without enrolling in Part B, you may be charged a late enrollment penalty. Um, Jennifer, do you have any uh, feedback here from, from COBRA? Have you dealt with any COBRA coverage to Medicare transition? Yeah, so um, I've had a couple of people who were on COBRA. And um, one couple in particular, um, what ends up happening where you see this come into play is if they are covering often an adult child through their group's insurance because adult children can be covered, um, I believe it's till age 26. And that was why they were trying to keep COBRA. Um, I've since talked with someone who works specifically with COBRA and they say that you can go off of COBRA and get a COBRA plan for the adult child um, based off of your plan. But if you move, if you should have been enrolled in Medicare, say you retired and you took COBRA instead of getting onto Medicare, Medicare will not recognize COBRA as creditable. So if you say, okay, I'm coming off of COBRA on October 1st, 
Well, they're not going to recognize that COBRA as creditable insurance from your employer. So they're going to put you into a different enrollment period, typically the general enrollment period, which is January through March. So you really want to make sure um, when you are getting ready to retire or if you're offered COBRA that the Medicare eligibility is not in place once you're given the choice. Because if the Medicare eligibility is in place, you want to be on Medicare. Um, if the choice is between Medicare or COBRA. And some people think, well, I'm just going to keep COBRA for a little while because they think it's the same as their group's insurance and you know, Medicare is going to be a little bit different. Um, but you just kind of want to realize what could happen, like the penalties are there, there's some delay on the enrollment periods, things like that, that can come into play. And I have seen it a couple of times, but it'll be a weird circumstance that causes it. You don't see it that often. Um, just kind of keep it in the back of your mind if COBRA becomes an option because maybe your your employer um, goes out of business before you turn 65 and now you're at the point mm -hmm. where you're you know 65 and el you know eligible for COBRA you just want to look at that and make sure so that you don't run into any, any penalties. Thanks for clarifying that. And I think that's uh, an eye-opening moment for me to just really understand that COBRA is not seen as an eligible group plan. I think that's something very critical. Uh, we do have a, a quick question. So I think we can you know, pause and answer this. If you were over 65 and covered under your spouse's health insurance, do you still have to enroll in Medicare? Again, if you were over 65 and covered under your spouse's health insurance, you still have to enroll in Medicare. Um, it's going to be the same. No. It's going to be the same criteria as it would be if it were your insurance. So how big is the employee? Mm -hmm. yeah. They're going to look at that. And when you do go to enroll in Medicare, there's a form you're going to take and you're going to have your employer sign off on it. And basically that form, even if you're going to enroll online, there's a place where you can attach it, you can mail it in. But it's basically a form that is verifying, hey, I was covered from the time I turned 65, you know, a lot of times way before you turn 65 until, say, June 30th of 2024 by um, XYZ company that has 500 employees or whatever. Um, that's going to be a form that you get signed by HR and it applies even to the spouse. The spouse would have that form signed off by HR of um, the company. Now, uh, I may save a, a brief story on this because I think, Jennifer, you actually connected with me and some clients of mine. Actually, they were my parents, really, because um, my dad had turned 65 in January. And I think all from September to January that year, he was like, hey, you know, we got to schedule a time, schedule a time, schedule a time. We need to talk about Medicare. Um, and, you know, he was covered under my mom's group plan uh, so mm -hmm. we were evaluating if it made sense for him to enroll in medicare and i think you know we had agreed actually what we're going to lead into one of the points was based on cost um, because the cost for the group plan uh, that my mom is paying for is actually less than the premium for part b or any other supplemental plan um, so it actually made sense for him not to enroll in part b uh, but the suggestion there was since you know he has enough credit maybe part a makes sense to enroll in um, just to have the membership and have his card for Medicare Part A for hospital visits. Um, but because he was part of the group plan through the spouse, who is larger than 20 employees, you know, he doesn't have to enroll in Part B for Medicare, right? That's true. So that's something to consider anytime you turn 65 and you're looking at your, your insurance versus what you can do on Medicare. And it's going to be a little further in the presentation where you touch on the costs that are associated with Medicare. But that's one of the first things I tell people is to look at what it costs for the insurance that you have through your employer, whether it's you and or it's you and your spouse. Sometimes the company may pay for the employee, but not the spouse. The spouse's insurance could be very expensive. It could be a lot more than what it's costing on Medicare. You may have a high deductible. When I say high deductible, I don't necessarily mean HSA. Um, if you have an HSA and you want to keep contributing to it, then obviously you don't want to enroll in any part of Medicare. Um, one thing I think we didn't touch on with HSAs, um, talking about people who are on HSAs and contributing to your HSAs is in planning for how you're going to use that money with Medicare later on. If you are enrolling to Medicare and you have an HSA, 
um, you know, with a significant balance in the account, or you're still working after 65 and you're thinking about whether or not you want to keep contributing to that HSA, the HSA funds can be used to pay for Medicare premiums and deductibles and co-pays and things like that. Um, it cannot be used to pay for a Medicare supplement, but there are quite a few things once you're on Medicare that the HSA will help you with. So when you're evaluating um, leaving group insurance to go on to Medicare, the HSA thing is a factor. If you're maxing out your HSA every year and you want to do that for a couple more years because it's going to help you down the road, you know, that's a big factor to consider. But um, if you are covered by your spouse's insurance, look at what it costs to be on that insurance. Um, even, you know, even if the employer doesn't pay for um, a significant part of the premium for the employee, I've had people say, well, I don't, I don't think I want to move over to Medicare. And I say, well, you know, that's no problem. It's your choice because you have, you work for a larger employer, but it's always a good idea to just sit down, look at your benefits and look at what it costs you. If you're getting, if someone thought that, that, that I met with recently, they thought they were paying um, significantly less per pay period than they were because they kind of had it in their head that it was costing them X amount of dollars biweekly. And it turned out that it was actually X amount of dollars weekly that they were paying for mm. their insurance. And when you sit down and you look at what Medicare costs them versus what that insurance through the employer costs them, you can continue working without being on your employer's plan. It's completely up to you. Um, but it's always a good idea to sit down and look and compare the two. That is awesome. I'm sure they were glad to have that money saved and still have good coverage, right? So Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. Speaking of enrolling in Medicare, this one is a pretty simple. Um, you can enroll online. Just go to www.medicare.gov. Click on the Get Started, Learn More About Medicare. The online application process is very easy and you will be guided through it. Um, I think I've also you know, had a client that went through the en enrollment process with medic uh with social security as well um as part of his you know starting of social security i think he just naturally uh went through the process of enrolling in medicare as well it didn't seem like a long-winded process at all um more so i think the the worst part of it was that he had to schedule a meeting with someone if he wanted to work with somebody on that specifically i uh, so they had to mail him a specific time that he would have to be available one month or two months in advance um, but I've seen the enrollment process for Medicare very easy. Um, I think also there is something um, that's known that if you are drawing Social Security, so if you're already drawing Social Security, you know, earlier than 65, um, by the time that you turn 65, I think you're automatically enrolled in Part A. Um, but I think you still have to enroll in the other parts of Medicare, um, even if you're drawing Social Security prior to your 65th birthday. Um, is that Correct, Jennifer, from the enrollment part? So from the enrollment aspect, if you're drawing your Social Security, Medicare sort of assumes, Social Security sort of assumes that you need Medicare and they're going to send you your card and you're going to get that card probably three months in advance. And because you're drawing Social Security and like we said, typically you're getting a premium free Part A, they're going to give you that Part B effective the first month of your 65th, the first of the month of, the, of your 65th birthday. Now, you may have started drawing at 62, but you're covered by your um, spouse's insurance and you're not ready to enroll in Medicare. You need to contact them, possibly send it back, say, look, I don't want Part B yet. Um, and they will take it off. You can leave Part A on. Like we said, if you're on the HSA, you may want neither A or B. But if you're on Social Security, you're going to get that card. You won't have to go through the enrollment process. If you're not taking Social Security, you do have to go on and enroll. A really quick, easy way to do it um, is SSA.gov. And SSA.gov is your own, you're logging into your own Social Security portal. And I tell everyone that I talk to, if you haven't set it up, it doesn't matter how old you are. I can go back and look at my paychecks from you know, when I was 25 years old, uh, not my yeah. paychecks, I should say my income and, um, you know, and see what I contributed and it'll give you estimates. And I mean, if anything, it's just good for information. It's like, oh, if you retire at right. this stage, you'll get this. So I always tell people, look, if you haven't set that up yet, set that up, but that's where you're going to go quick and easy. You can apply for benefits without 
applying for social security benefits, you can apply for your Medicare benefits on SSA.gov. The application process is pretty fast because it's your own portal. So they already have some of your information in there because it's your social security portal. Um, it's very secure. It's gonna take a little bit if you've never done it before, um, setting up the two-factor authentication and everything. But then once you have that, enrolling in Medicare is easy from there. A lot of people will then just need to go in later on and apply for Part B. That application is even quicker because now they've got your A. So now you're going to go in. And that's where I said, remember earlier when I said there was a form you get your employer to sign off on or your HR to sign off on. Mm -hmm. That's where you're going to attach that form and say, look, I'm ready for my mm -hmm. Part B. And the Part B is really the um, coverage that you want to focus in on when you want it, when you want it to start, because you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it either by your social security distribution, or if you're not taking social security yet, they're going to be billing you for it. So, um, you know, like I said, if you're taking social security prior to 65, you're going to be getting that card in the mail. It's going to have the dates on it. You're going to see if you turn 65 June 15th, it's going to say June 1st, 2024, part A, part B, June 1st, 2024. And you may want it or you may not but you'll get that in the mail. Perfect. Um, and if you have not joined us for a social security seminar in the past, you may, I will tell you this, you may have heard this before, but my suggestion is that every year um, for those who have not yet taken their benefit for social security, I always suggest after tax filing uh, to go log online to your My Social Security and to review your statement every year after you file taxes, they're supposed to update your earnings history. And for those that know about Social Security, they take a look at your highest uh, 30 years of earnings. Um, and I've actually met with a client recently that um, unfortunately went out on disability for a short period of time before getting back into work. Uh, but in reviewing her statement, we actually found that they didn't properly record her 2023 uh, earnings for that year. And it was a pretty substantial difference. I mean, we're talking double digit you know, difference in, in her benefit, all because of that one miscalculation of a year. Um, so strong encouragement for everyone after tax filing year or any point after that, uh, to just take a look at your statement, make sure that they properly recorded uh, what you paid taxes on into Social Security so that they have an accurate record of that. Uh, but to Jennifer's point, that's where you also can see your eligibility for Medicare, but also enroll in Medicare when appropriate. Um, so I'm actually going to pass things off to uh, Jennifer for the how private insurance works. Um, Jennifer. All right. So how private insurance works with Medicare to provide complete coverage. This is kind of where I come in, um, especially if you're calling me or we're meeting for the first time and you are um, deciding, OK, when am I going to enroll in Medicare? Well, we're going to talk about when you want your A and B to be effective, your A and your B is your hospital coverage and your medical coverage. So we're not getting too into the coverages on that, but um, original Medicare is part A, part B. And we said part A, think of it as premium free for the most part, and then part B, you're gonna pay for it. Pretty much everybody's paying for it unless somehow you're you know, eligible for uh, Medicaid or there's some assistance if you're a lower income um, as far as part B goes. But once you have those two things in place, you're then kind of figuring out which way you wanna go with your insurance when it comes to Medicare, because you don't just wanna have part A and part B. So um, there are, uh, gaps here that may be covered by private insurance, and that would be the deductibles, co-insurance amounts, prescription drugs. So if we get a little further into that, um, gaps may be filled by employer or retiree insurance that includes creditable drug coverage. And that's a big factor to consider, um, creditable drug coverage and creditable insurance, talking about that. Um, or so if you have employer insurance or retiree insurance that you're working, you know, that's going to work with your Medicare, I have some um, employees of a town that's near me and I know what they get from the town as part of their retiree package. So when we look at the retiree package, this particular area gives them um, this retirement benefit and the premium is based on years served. So the less you worked 
the higher your premium may be. And that's what you're kind of comparing to what's available to you in whether or not you want to just go out and get a Medicare supplement and then a standalone prescription drug plan, or you want to choose an Advantage plan. So you're looking at whether or not your employer provides you with something like that. You want to make sure if they do, it has drug coverage. If it does not have drug coverage in this particular town has a plan that offers coverage, but it does not include drug coverage. So all of their um, retirees come in, I'm not saying all of them, I'm just saying in general, they need to get Part D drug coverage. Medicare does not make you get Part D coverage, but they will penalize you down the road if you go to enroll in it and you didn't have it from the time you were eligible. Um, like we said, talking about being covered by your employer. If your employer has creditable insurance, it means that there is drug coverage that is considered creditable by Medicare. You're not going to be penalized if you go and when you're 68 years old and you sign up for, um, you know, a Medicare supplement with a drug plan because you had creditable insurance. But when you are eligible for your <laughs> A and B, you have that in place. You're choosing between. If, you're, if the employer option is off the table, maybe your employer doesn't offer that. Do I want a Medicare supplement or a Medigap or with a standalone drug plan? Or do I want to choose to have a Medicare Advantage plan that uh, provides care in an all-inclusive format like an HMO or a PPO? And that's really what we would sit down and talk about. So some of the things to consider are... Um, can you see the doctor you want? Are the right specialists available if you need them? So this is a, this is a um, kind of a coverage question. You're going to say, okay, is it how important is this to me to be able to access a wide variety of doctors? Some people just want to make sure that the doctors that they see, maybe they say two or three, and if they're in a network, they're happy with that. Um, when you are evaluating Medicare, a lot of times people will compare it, kind of see what they had when they were working versus Medicare with a supplement and Medicare, a Medicare Advantage um, plan. But one of the things you're going to consider is that network of doctors and how important that is to you. So that's something to consider. And then how much will you have to pay for your medications? So this is something when you're looking at a prescription drug plan or a standalone Part D prescription drug plan or an Advantage plan because an Advantage plan will often include drug coverage as part of the plan. You will see some plans that don't. Some people don't want drug coverage because maybe they have coverage through the VA and their drug coverage is considered creditable, the VA portion of the drug coverage. Um, some federal employees I've seen that uh, don't get drug coverage, uh, Medicare drug coverage because their coverage is considered creditable as far as that goes. But for the most part, when you look at an Advantage plan, there an Advantage plan is gonna have your Part A, your Part B and your Part D rolled together into one type of plan, which is the Advantage plan. So you're gonna to wanna to look at how much is our medicine's gonna cost when I'm on Medicare. That's a factor when you're you know, planning these things out. What are the monthly premiums? This is a big one because um, budgets determine our, a lot of our decisions in retirement. And when you are getting ready to go on to Medicare, a big thing to think about two, three, four, five years out, sometimes you're thinking about it right before you enroll. What, what is it going to cost me? What's Medicare going to cost me? Um, what are the choices that I'm making on Medicare going to cost me? And these answers are going to be different when you're 65 from when you're 75. Because when you're 65, if you're going to go the Medicare supplement route, you're going to get a premium most likely for someone who's 65 in, in your county. And that premium is not the same as someone maybe who's 75. So these are things you're going to have to kind of think about and evaluate um, on a Medicare Advantage plan. What would the premiums be? You know, is there a premium? You know, all things to think about. Um, what other out-of-pocket costs might you incur based on your expected health care usage? Co-payments for each doctor visit, full payment for non-covered services, dental, vision, hearing, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> basically, you're deciding when you're getting ready to get onto Medicare, how important having these things are to you. Dental, vision, and hearing, those 
that routine type of service that you see right there, that's not included in Medicare. Original Medicare does not cover you for your exams and your cleanings on your fit on your uh, at the dentist's office. The routine vision, um, you know, maybe your prescription changes because we're aging. That's not covered by original Medicare. Um, hearing updated hearing aids and things like that. So you may see that, you may see that kind of stuff being advertised on TV. People may be calling you, they may be leading the phone call or the, the mail, you know, with that, with those benefits. Um, those are benefits that are either going to be embedded into um, a private insurance plan, which would be like a Medicare Advantage plan, or you would have to purchase a standalone dental vision and hearing plan if you chose the Medicare supplement and drug plan route. So there are all th factors to consider. Some people want to go to the doctor and never pay a copay. They would rather pay upfront every month, pay the premium, and never get, you know, you know, a few weeks after you go to the doctor and sometimes they run labs and then you get the bill for the labs three weeks later. Yep. Some people don't want that anymore. Hate <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, like some people don't mind it. Yeah. So, you know, those are all factors to consider. Those are all things to sit down and say, okay, well, what will I have? What's it going to look like? Because you can, it can look very different than the insurance that you have while you're working when you're on Medicare. Yeah, that's one of the things that we talked about prior to uh, starting this. I know I definitely had questions uh, as I was reviewing this was, um, how do people cover the dental insurances since Medicare does not cover it? Um, and I know, you know, we were talking about my experiences with that too, but you can get separate coverage for dental vision and hearing outside can, of Medicare yes. or it can be, okay. Yes, gotcha. you can get a standalone plan the minute you pay for separately. Mm -hmm. uh, so speaking of costs, because I, I know we talked a lot about costs um, and I'm going to flow through this because I know we're a little bit over our plan time, which is perfectly fine. So thank you for staying on this far. Uh, but expense items that you do want to factor in, um, I just really just parenthetically uh, make this statement here. If you have not looked at your path to retirement, uh, we have awesome tools and resources to uh, not only show your progress report towards retirement and making sure that you have enough, that your money's going to last long enough, but we can also estimate your expenses in retirement. One of those expenses being cost of uh, health care in retirement. Uh, so not only are we looking at the monthly premiums for the different coverages, uh, but we can also estimate what your out-of-pocket costs will be, as in the deductibles, the co-payments, the co-insurance, or payments to providers for non-covered services. Uh, for parts B and D, um, most, uh, most people will have premiums for parts B and D that you can see on the screen. Uh, but depending on your income, I think this was also something that Jennifer, you and I had kind of just had a little bit of exchange here um, that we wanted to be sure that we shared with every one of you. Um, but depending on your modified adjusted gross income, um, there may be a surcharge or uh, an additional cost for parts B and D. Part B is your, again, your doctor visits, things along those lines. Part D would be your prescription drugs. So as you can see, depending on one, your filing status, if you are single, if you're a single filer, or if you're married filing jointly, um, depending on what your total modified adjusted gross income is, there may be additional costs to the same base coverage that everyone else is getting. Um, why I say that is because even if you have the extra $69 or $174 premium added to your Medicare Parts D and D, um, there isn't any additional premium or premier or concierge service that you would get in Medicare, right? You're still getting the same type of coverage, the same level or service for those premiums. Um, and where we've seen this is not simply high earners in retirement uh, from those that, you know, may have saved a substantial amount, but in years where you may take extra money out of retirement account, um, say leading up to retirement, there was a large payout, whether there was like a settlement or a buyout from your previous employer, um, I think Jennifer, you had mentioned someone had sold their house and there was a large capital gain, right? Even though capital gains are taxed at a different rate than ordinary income, um, that total earnings and income add to your modified adjusted gross income, right? Um, it does, so yeah. Why we highlight this is because there are ways to prepare or plan for distributions in retirement, um, but being familiar with what your total taxable income is um, it could possibly save you from having income adjustments on your income. Um, Jennifer, I think you even have something to share on 
what we call Irma. Uh, what was it that you had mentioned earlier for Irma? So Irma is going to be applied to your Part B premium. Um, if you're signing up for Medicare because you're retiring, maybe it's after the age of 65, maybe it's right at 65. Um, you may get a bill. If you're not taking Social Security, you may get a bill for the first three months of your Part B. And then a few weeks later, you get another bill and you say, well, where is this bill coming from? And now it's three months of your Irma attached to it. Um, basically, the adjusted amount that they're... Um, charging you for your part B premium, or maybe in addition to your part D premium. Um, but if say you retire and they're looking at two years ago, what you were making and the retirement that's going to take place this year is going to drastically bring down your income and bring it down into one of these brackets. You can file a form called an SS 44 form and appeal this amount. Um, they will look at your work stoppage. There's several life-changing events, divorce, death of a spouse, but retirement or work stoppage is something to consider. So if you're getting ready to retire and you're looking at this chart and you're going, wow, two years ago, I was, you know, we were married and we were filing $250,000 a year, but now I'm going to stop working. And, uh, you know, if, if we make 90,000, I'll be happy, you know, in retirement, fill out the form and appeal it. You know, they will look at that and consider it as a life-changing event and bring that, um, that Irma down potentially. Um, it, definitely something to consider. Yeah, so just to kind of, you know, repeat that. So they look two years, they look back two years on your taxes, right? How you file your taxes, your modified adjusted gross income to determine if you would have that adjustment on your premium. Um, and what you were saying is there are qualifying events that you can file an appeal to remove that. But the IRMA seems to be like a recurring thing where every year they're looking at your tax filing. It's not just the first year that you enroll. This is right. over the course of your retirement, right? Yes. So at the end of the year, gotcha. you may see an adjustment for the starting in January for the upcoming year of what your Part B is going to be. And they may have looked at the previous two years taxes. They have that information. And now they're saying, well, as of January of this year, your premium is going to be X amount. And that's because two years prior you had made money. And so um, like in the case of, of someone that I had who sold a piece of property, um, she sold this property. Uh, I can't remember if she inherited it or if she just owned it separately. But anyway, the year she sold it, it really um, affected her taxes and she had been on Medicare for a while. Her appeal was not successful because that was not considered a life changing event. So she did have that Irma for the entire 12 months. Now, once the 12 months was over, now they're looking, they were going to, you know, look at the following year, that bump in income was not there. So her, her part B premium came back down, but it's definitely something mm -hmm. to consider because you could see that, or you may get a bill for it. And if you're wondering what it is, Irma can catch people by surprise. Absolutely. And uh, just to, I did get a question while we, while you were sharing that, uh, just to define what IRMA is, please excuse the jargon, but it's income related adjustment amount. Uh, not quite sure where the M came in there. It's I-R-A-A, -A, but it's I-R-M-A-A, -A, income related adjustment uh, I think amount. it's monthly. Um, but, yeah, I think it's income related monthly oh, adjustment. Oh, monthly income. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. See, this is why I have you up here. See, you just catch the things that I always look. <laughs> uh, but I also want to highlight, too, not just uh, the income, but look at the filing status. If you were someone that's filing single versus filing jointly, but say you're you know, married, filing separately for whatever reason that may be, look at the threshold, the difference in the threshold. If you're married, filing separate, um, for you to be in that second bracket, it's 103 to 369. So if you're a modified adjusted gross income, exceeds 103, you're already in a, a higher income adjustment versus Mary, just filing Mary filing jointly. So um, please be aware of, you know, your tax filing status. Um, also, I'm just, you know, throwing different scenarios that I've seen, but um, a survivor, right, coming from married filing jointly to Mary uh, to single, whether you're a divorced widow, uh, but if you're inheriting money from a spouse and the spouse leaves you in a, uh, you know, with a substantial amount of retirement money and say that money is coming from qualified accounts like traditional IRAs or anything that you're required to take distribution. Uh, depending on your situation, you may be bumped up in a whole nother bracket, not just in taxes, but also for Medicare premium. Uh, so this is absolutely something that, you know, you don't perfectly have to memorize, but it is something that you should review in your plan for income and retirement. 
Um, so speaking of, as we're looking at expenses, uh, monthly premiums for supplemental insurance, when we're talking about the cost, if you were on original Medicare and say you had a Medigap policy with a monthly premium of about $200, or if you had an additional drug plan around 40, and this is just an average number, this isn't exactly what they are, or if you had a Medicare Advantage plan worth $50 per month, when you look at out-of-pocket costs for co-payments and drug and doctor visits or um, not having coverage for dental, vision, so on and so forth, we were to look at an example of a monthly budget just for all that coverage. Medicare Part B premium for those who are paying for that this year, this 174.70 before any adjustment. If you had a Medigap policy for about 200 a month and a prescription drug, you're paying $414 per month. But it's not just the premiums, as we said before. When you look at out-of-pocket costs for prescription drugs, any dental out-of-pocket costs for just routine cleaning, if you have vision or alternative care, your total annual cost would be 6,500 per year. Um, and most people, especially for people that I speak with when they're looking at retirement, very seldom are, you know, are they including any of these costs in their monthly budget? They're looking at their normal lifestyle because they're so accustomed to looking at, you know, what they're getting in their paycheck after they paid for health insurance from their benefits with the employer. Um, so this is absolutely something that as you're looking at retiring and making sure that you have enough, this is absolutely something that you do want to factor into your plan. Um, I think you had something to share here for the transition into Medicare, Jennifer. So for transitioning into Medicare, um, basically you want to determine the effective date of your coverage. It's the first month that you turn 65 or when you go off of the over 20 employer plan. And I think someone had asked in the question box about um, mm -hmm. do they need part B if you're still on your spouse's insurance. So if you retire um, this year, but you're covered by your spouse's insurance, if that insurance is for a company that has more than 20 employees, then you just want to double check with HR, make sure the coverage is considered creditable, and you can choose to stay on that if you want to, um, or you can uh, uh, move over to Medicare. Like I said, look at what it, it's going to cost you to be on that insurance and use that insurance versus what Medicare is going to cost you. And those numbers that we shared a minute ago, those are pretty general numbers. You can, you can really um, get more specific on that. Um, once you sit down and look at, you know, what plans are in your area based on where you live and everything, but you're going to want to determine your effective date of your coverage. Some people get it right the, the month they're turning 65 and it will not be effective. You have the three months before you turn 65, but it's not going to be effective until the month you turn and it'll be the first of the month that you turn 65, um, that you're eligible and you want to determine that effective date. So you are going to, um, before the effective date, when you're evaluating this, you're going to want to determine how the employer or retiree insurance is going to work with Medicare. So if you have that insurance, if you are enrolling, even if you're going to enroll in Part A, you just kind of want to see how that's going to work with it. Um, or if you're getting a retiree plan and you're on Medicare, you're going to have the Medicare working with that retiree plan, determine how that's going to be before um, your effective date of your A and your B. Um, if keeping the employer retiree insurance for the supplemental coverage, enroll in A and B, and then ask the plan about enrolling in Part D. So like I said, some employers retiree plans will include Part D. Some you may need to go out and look and see, hey, do I need a Part D plan? Okay, what's that going to look like? And that's something that I help people with. That's what we do. Um, that insurance side of it. Uh, if not keeping that employer or retiree insurance, you're going to decide, this is where I say fork in the road, you can go left or you can go right, you're going to pick, do I want to have a Medigap? So Medigap and Medicare supplement mean the same thing in Medicare world. Um, if you hear someone say I have a Medicare supplement, that's pretty specific. They don't have an Advantage plan, but some people use supplement as in addition to. In Medicare world, Medicare supplement is something specific. So it's a plan that fills in the gaps of what Medicare does not cover. So you're gonna to wanna to decide, do I want that Medigap with a drug plan versus the Advantage plan? There's pros and cons to both. There's no, neither one is perfect. Um, there's different expenses involved in both. 
you want to know what those are and kind of evaluate them. Some things that are important to, I've even had married couples where one will choose one route and the other will choose the other route. It's very individual and Medicare is an individual type thing. You don't have to be, you're not on the same, like with your insurance through your work, when you say, okay, I'm on my insurance and my, my spouse is on there as well. Like my insurance, my, my spouse, my husband's on my insurance. My kids are on my insurance. We're all on the same plan. We're all working with the same pot. If it says max out of pocket and it's this number and we hit it as a family, that's Medicare is not like that. Medicare is very individual. Um, so when you see max out of pockets on say a Medicare Advantage plan, that's not you and your spouse. That's always gonna be very uh, individual when it comes to that. Um, but you are evaluating between those two things. Do I want a supplement and a drug plan or do I want an advantage plan? And then you want to shop for the plans, choose one, apply for coverage starting on the effective date. You really want to line up the effective date of your Medicare supplement and drug plan or your advantage plan to um, align with the effective date of your for the most part B. And when I say B, I say that because sometimes people have a part A that starts sooner. I had a lady just recently and she turned 65 last October, but she didn't come off of her husband's insurance until uh, May 1st was the effective date. So her A, her part A was effective October 1st, 2023. Her B was effective May 1st, 2024. She mm -hmm. chose a route that she wanted to take for her insurance. And when she came in and sat down, we made sure it all aligned with the, with the 5-1-2024 effective date because it went, it went along with the part B. Um, and then enroll in Medicare parts A, B, and D starting on the effective date. So you're choosing what that date is, and that's when you want to enroll in that, make that decision. And then um, in the fall, review your plan documents for the coming year for Advantage plans and drug plans. There is a form or a notice that comes in the mail, usually the end of September, beginning of October. It's called the Annual Notice of Change. And the Medicare Advantage and drug plans, not Supplements, Medicare Advantage plans and Medicare drug plans are required to send you these notices to let you know how they're going to change for January 1st. So these plans, the coverage that you see um, in your plan documents, say for 2024, those are going to run all the way to December 31st. September, end of September, beginning of October, you're going to see that if you stay on that plan, here's going to be the changes. There may be hardly any changes, very insignificant changes. There may be huge changes, but that's something that you want to look at because October 15th to December 7th is your window of opportunity to make a change on those two types of plans. Um, if you're on original Medicare with a supplement plan and you say, hey, I think I want to try an Advantage plan this year. That's the time to do it, October 15th to December 7th. That's also why you see so many Medicare ads on TV and in your mailbox, because they're all trying to say, hey, if you want to try us out, do it now. Don't answer your phone when people call you up, the phone solicitors, or uh, even some of the mail stuff. You want to evaluate. This is where I live. This is what's available in my area. Someone calling you on the phone is trying to try to get you to enroll in their plan or their handful of things that they have. You want to look at that, evaluate the choices that are available to you every fall and, you know, pick the one that's right for you. You may want to stay with where you're at. You may want to change nothing. You may have had new prescriptions um, that were prescribed in say June of that year. And now all of a sudden you're paying a lot of money at the pharmacy. Well, that's the time that you're going to want to go back and say, well, what drug plans are out for next year? You may want to move to a drug plan that helps you with those drug costs a little bit better. And there's going to be a lot of that over the next uh, few months, things that are going to come out because the Inflation Reduction Act has um, changed what your out-of-pocket is going to be next year for uh, uh, prescriptions at the pharmacy. So I love these uh, last two slides and uh, we're going to be closing in just another minute. So thank you so much again for staying on this time. Um, but these last two slides are, are really like checklists. Um, and I do love as much as we do Medicare, I have to be honest, it, you know, I, so, so many times we uh, present this information. Uh, I think we give off the signal that you definitely want to make the right decision, make the right decision. Um, it is good, especially with this slide to know that you can make adjustments and you can make changes. Um, so I think this is very refreshing to, to just know that this should be a part of your uh, routine maintenance, right? So annually in the fall, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, September or around October towards the end of December, 
Um, there's uh, enrollment to make changes or adjustments to whatever coverages that you have. Um, and yeah, you're definitely going to be solicited. Uh, if you're not already getting mail leading up to 65, you're definitely going to be getting the phone calls and you'll see Jimmy JJ Walker on the commercials talking about different plans. Uh, but I think it's opportunities like these where, you know, Jennifer and I are able to be in front of you and uh, be the trusted resource that you can know, like, and trust uh, to give you the right guidance, give you the right perspective, um, and, and definitely make sure that you're going to make the best decision for what's available to you. Uh, so leading and closing, you know, we do have a closing slide. We always want you to uh, take action, uh, whether that action is simply uh, connecting with Jennifer to ask more specific questions on Medicare and supplemental coverage, uh, or if it's connected with me to review uh, the financing side, the uh, planning and budgeting side of things, uh, we definitely want to make sure that you take action with the education that you receive today. Um, secondly, we also are receiving feedback. If there was something that uh, you did hear that you liked, maybe there were some things that we did not cover, or maybe you don't like these at all. I definitely want the feedback. Uh, so don't be afraid to be very critical of, of our presentation this evening. Uh, but we, you know, want to make sure that you're getting a good experience from these and we continue to provide education and information that's suitable for you. So, um, Jennifer, any closing statements for you at the moment? Um, no, I just, you know, thanks for inviting me out. Um, there's a lot. We could talk. We could take every slide that was here and we could really get super in depth with it. There's a lot you can get into when it comes to Medicare. There's so many different scenarios and situations. That's why, you know. Talk to someone that you trust, talk to someone that you know, um, someone that's referred to you. Like I said, the person who's calling you on the phone bought your name off of a list. And, um, you know, I, I don't like that. Uh, it happens to me, it happens to my husband, it happens to my dad. It's just nonstop with that. But you really, you know, it's good to ask questions to people that are, um, somehow connected to you, whether it's someone that you know that they trust, that they work with. But um, there's a lot of confusion out there. Medicare can be tricky um, and it doesn't have to be. Once you're on it and you start to understand it, it may seem overwhelming right now, but it's not. It's it's really not once you're on it. you'll And you will find that out. Everyone will find that out when they're on Medicare. I mean, there may be some parts of it that you don't like, but like I said, there's no perfect solution to any kind of health care. Um, but Medicare is a really great option as far as um, what's available to you, you know, after age 65. And some people just, it's daunting because there is a lot to it, but um, I think you will, I think you'll be surprised and, and, uh, and end up liking it actually. Uh, we did have a two part question in closing. I think we may be able to address one part of the question um, or one part of that question. Uh, maybe not both, but it was most more so saying, um, Sorry, there's lots of questions. Uh, uh, so the situation was I retired in 2020, would turn 65 December 2024. My spouse is working and I'm currently on my spouse's health plan, which is 20 plus employees. Can I stay on a spouse's health plan plus take Medicare A and B? So that's a different style of question. I think the emphasis there is plus taking Medicare A and B. Can she still be covered by the spouse's plan? Yes, you can have A and B and you can have the spouse's plan. Um, if you're choosing to do that, you want to understand why you're doing that. I, and when I say you want to understand that, why you're doing that, there's got to be a reason why you're going to pay for Part B and be paying for the employer's insurance or having the employer's insurance. Maybe the employer's insurance has no premium to you and you just kind of want to have it as um, uh, Medicare is, you know, the backup. Um, I would sit down and look at what, if you're on uh, your spouse's insurance and you want to get onto A and B and you already know you're going to pay the 174.70 a month this year for part B uh, next year, we're going to find out what that's going to be for next year, uh, usually October, November, sometimes even September. But um, you kind of want to compare that to what you can do on your own if you were not on your spouse's insurance, you know, cost wise, those numbers for a Medigap where it said $200 a month. Um, that's a very general number because that's not taking into consideration if if I'm speaking right now to people who are in central Virginia, that's probably taking an average of several different age groups across a wide area, you know, maybe multiple states. So it's really good to look at what's available to you based on your age and your zip code and then compare it to the coverage you have with your spouse. 
awesome. 